Bueno, vamos a iniciar la, la última parte de, de los programas. Vamos a hablar con, con la última ponencia que vamos a tener ahora, que acaba el doctor de Lucha. En primer lugar, eh, recordaros que está abierto el tema de las preguntas, que durante la ponencia podéis eh, ir poniendo las, las preguntas que queráis. Recordaros que eh, a la salida que nadie se lleve los audífonos de traducción a casa, ¿eh? porque como tenemos los cartéis de identidad, creo que se cobrarán unos 250 euros por cada uno. Solo. Bien. Ah, también, por favor, eh, tenéis las encuestas. ¿eh? Entonces, por favor, eh, poner ahí lo que os ha gustado, lo que os ha gustado, porque luego con todo esto haremos un sorteo entre los ponentes. Vamos pasando los últimos. Bueno, paso, paso mientras entra los últimos a presentarnos al doctor Martin de Busse. Él es consultor veterinario agrícola internacional. Es miembro del grupo Consultor Redworks. Eh, sus principales líneas de interés están en condiciones infecciosas y no infecciosas del intestino y del tracto respiratorio. Él es un experto y además la gran ventaja es que es un experto de campo, es un hombre que está mucho en él. Él nos va a hablar un poco de diagnóstico diferencial de cocheras en Breuer desde un punto de vista holístico. ¿De acuerdo? Doctor, thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, uh, sponsor of the farm who, uh, who paid for my trip, for my price, and for my trip uh, this time. I also would like to uh, thank uh, the organization. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Luis Carrasco has asked me a few years ago to come and present at uh, the famous uh, meetings here um, organized by Avenues. And it's uh, my pleasure to finally be able to uh, be here. Um, when he suggested the subject two years ago, he said, why don't you talk about gut health? And um, at that moment, I thought, yes, that is my favorite topic, and this is what I want to uh, uh, what I want to talk about. Now, when this invitation came along um, earlier, a few months ago, the question was, what about local diseases? And um, you would think, yeah, it's a very different subject, but I also think you have heard from this morning, the speakers, different speakers, and also in the, in the round table discussion, it was clear that if we talk about local diseases, we have to look at a complex of diseases. We, of course, always, not only for local health, always we have to ensure all the forms and borders, Focusing on management, intestinal health, respiratory and systemic health, and yes, indeed, since say five years, yeah, uh, we have a lot of problems with locomotory issues in the world. Yeah. So, locomotory health is more and more considered as one of the important uh, disease um, uh, issues that we have to cope with. And you will also understand that there is a link with each of the other aspects of health and management. Yeah, uh, but today we will focus on local health, and the conclusion I will tell you, and already disclosed conclusion, is that there is a main strong link with intestinal health that we have to uh, consider. I am also very fortunate today because I can go for a holistic review of local diseases. Because the speakers of this morning and this early afternoon, they have already told all the details about different etiology. Uh, components that can contribute to local health. So what I was asked to do now is to bring together all these different presentations and ideas and bring to you a holistic view. <coughs> um, and that is what I will try to do with your permission. So, if you just want to understand a certain disease complex, it's never wrong to look back in time. <laughs> and um, if you look at the different uh, causes of local motor diseases, that changed through time, you could see that in the 80s, we mainly looked at non-infectious causes of local issues, 
like bone deformities and uh, TB. In the 90s, we had other problems. And what we suffered most with in the 90s, let's say in a Western European context, was Google disease causing immunosuppression, and as a secondary consequence, we were facing bacterial infection in joints and bones. If you look at the later 90s, 2000s, yeah, we had drastic changes, starting in Scandinavia, but going down in the rest of Europe, where we had removal of meat and bone meal from the food diets. We also had um, removal of growth hormones in 2003. And what could we see initially? Less digestible calcium and phosphorus sources causing, uh, causing types of uh, arthritis. Yeah? And then later on, with the move of local motors, we can say that initially we were dealing with not per se necrotic arthritis. And maybe some of you will remember when you were removing and uh, as local motors, everyone was afraid that you have drastic always of necrotic arthritis. We didn't see that. What we saw was a kind of mild enteritis. There's people that call it dysbacteriosis, bacterial enteritis, prostheosis. Yeah? But this type of enteritis has caused growth disorders. And also, it has led to all views of animals. Because most nutritionists, when they removed animal global models, they said, I will bring more weight in my animal programs to animals. Why? I know for us have antioxidant action, but also they have purely an antiprostridium action. So they start to use a lot of iophores, yeah, overuse, and what we could see is not per se clinical overbase of oxygenosis, but we start to see more subtle oxygenosis, and as a consequence also again at this bacterium and Now since 2010, and I put it in brackets yeah, because it was mentioned earlier today, we talk about anthroxychloroquine, but in the meantime, we understand it's more broad than only anthroxychloroquine. Yeah? Since, since 2010, we see something new. Since about five, six years, uh, uh, it's BCO, anthroxychloroquine species of cellulitis. And that is something that is extremely interesting for practitioners to try to understand. Yeah? It has been brought already passionately this morning by earlier speakers. Yeah? But to try to understand the cause of BCO and analog problems brings us back to where we are heading to this food industry. And we are heading to a continuous selection for birds that have a very high average daily growth and a very low food conversion rate. And I will explain to you what that has to do with analog support later in this presentation. Now, I was also asked to give some guidelines how a practitioner like myself, how we will assess um, uh, leg problems or leg problems as a practitioner. And some of these um, rules that we have learned during our education, we have to fresh it up. Yeah? Because very often I see people, when they hear a phone call from a farmer about laying, they say, oh, I already know what it is. It is at this moment that of a rail going on, so it must be a rail. Take some blood samples, I will check. From my, from my desk, I will check the results. Right? Some other people, um, they don't take the effort anymore to do the classic, fundamental job of a practitioner, which is going into the house and look at the birds. And surprisingly, with locomotive problems, sometimes by looking at the way the lameness is occurring in the farm, we can already be pretty sure, even more than on blood samples or on PCR, we can already be pretty sure on what is the cause of the locomotor issue. Right? So it's very important that we go into uh, the field and we first make an assessment of the flow. Right? Gather the information by using your senses is for locomotor issues even more important than for other diseases. Right? So we go into the farm, you look at the general flock health and try to estimate the percentage of the late birds. Check in the meantime also, can you already see some skin scratches or not? Extremely important is what is the type of lanes. And I will go back to that and give you some examples, like the weak type of lanes or the typical uh, 
uh, yeah, on the hog sitting type of lanes, but you see that the This identification of the type of lanes uh, will already teach you probably what is the cause of that lanes. Condition of litter. If you call and you ask a farmer, what is the condition of the litter? Some farmers, even when it's a swamp, they will say it's probably okay this time. Yeah? And other farmers, as soon as they see a small touch of humidity, they will complain, oh, the litter quality is very bad. Yeah? The only way to assess it is to by doing it yourself. Yeah? Then you have your own benchmark that you can compare, and you can judge if the condition of the litter is good or, or bad. Next, once you have an idea of the general picture of the flock, yeah, go and examine the live laying birds. The best way to do that is to take some of the birds outside the house and see how they behave outside. Yeah. Why? Well, a combination. Also, you look at the birds inside the house, but you can afterwards you can also take some birds outside the house. Why? Because it's very important to check if there's a pain response in the legs. Yeah. If there's a pain response in the legs or not, will they then guide you? direction of the etiology of the legs. I will come back to that in a minute. And of course, you have to make the interpretation of the management. How is the ventilation? How is a little management? How is the feet management? Uh, how is the feet looking like? Is it a very strong pet or is it very dusty? Um, how is the quality um, of, uh, of, of the water uh, lines? Um, Remember, musculoskeletal disorders are often or always, uh, almost always, multifactorial. Yeah? So you will have to uh, try to identify the original uh, complications in different areas. I will give you one example of relatedness and less mobility that people don't always associate with other causes. Yeah? Um, uh, a, pro uh, a problem that is very often yeah, is is rejection to the slaughterhouse. This type of image, and then people um, wonder how can we reduce the number of rejections to the slaughterhouse. Well, you have to go back. You have to go back by doing your diagnosis in the flock. And then um, what you will see is the less mobile birds uh, associated with any uh, type of uh, um, TD or foot metamorphosis or femoral head necrosis. What you will see is these lame birds, they will not move when other birds climb over them, especially if their stock intensity is very high, and especially if they have combination of birds with some type of or, uh, original lameness in high density with red litter, yeah. and if it's also management-wise, there's not enough feeder pads, and or if the periods of drugs are too long, all these parameters can play a role. Why? Uh, the less mobile birds will suffer from strip catches and that will lead to rejection of the house. What will be your job is to check any of these factors that they know that could in the end lead to this. Because in some farms it could be this, in other farms it could be more of that. So you need to identify and the only way and only place you can do it is in each the farm. And for every chicken farm it can be a different solution that you have to offer based on that. Uh, pathogenesis that you identified. So once we have investigated the live birds, we also have to go for a post-mortem examination. And then it's important, obviously, to be able to discriminate infectious locomotory issues with non-infectious locomotory issues. Uh, check if you see spinal pathology, abscesses, deformation of the vertebrae, bone deformities, symmetry versus torsion, tendon or muscle lesions, thickening of a uh, gastrocnemius tendon, stiffer and hot joints, excessive synovial fluids, was mentioned this morning, all these parameters, yeah? but this is a list of what you have to check, hip joints, check for femoral head necrosis, and check your foot pads with cross lesions. That is a, a pretty complete list of what you have to uh, check in birds when specifically you, you are looking for locomotory issues. Now, I will go now very quickly over the different etiologies that can be link, linked with locomotory issues, eh? um, because previous speakers have been going into detail already this morning. But just as a quick rehearsal, eh, femoral head necrosis is still probably, if you look globally, the most common um, cause of severe lameness. 
etiology, staphylococci, anthrococci, SCV and coli, and then the pathogenesis is easily um, to understand, a bacteremia that will infect a growth plate and will lead to osteomyelitis. Yeah? There are some predisposing factors that can make the incidence in some farms higher than in other ones. Yeah? Because very often people say, yes, it's genetics. No, it's not genetics, because the genetics in all the farms is the same. Yeah? It is these predisposing factors that will define why some houses have more uh, uh, issues with uh, fibrillar head necrosis than other ones. And you have to look at skin, footpath, intestinal and respiratory lesions, and egg and hatchery uh, hygiene. If you look typically, we start to see this kind of picture of a wingtip walking bird eh, around three weeks of uh, age. You have seen this uh, <coughs> picture this morning also, where you can identify this degradation with the proximal femur. Um, this is enough for you to know that this is femoral head necrosis, but very often we do, on top of that, bacteriology to identify the original pathogen or the bacterium that is involved, and also if you can see to make an antibiogram if you want to treat that we at least have an idea what we were test. <coughs> this morning we had a very good talk on spinal osteomyelitis eh, with the etiology. Um, Anthropocus chicorum and other uh, Anthropocus species. Um, this is something that I um, would like to stress upon. We were fooled in the beginning by classic um, identification methods in bacteriology. The classic biochemical methods will usually tell you you are dealing with Anthropocus chicorum. Okay? I can tell you, since we are using about five years, we are using multi trough techniques which is a novel technique to identify different species and strains of bacteria, we see that in the majority of the Anthropocus chicorum cases, it is Anthropocus species, but it can be Anthropocus hirae, it can be Anthropocus facium, it can be fecalis. So I don't agree to call this disease Anthropocus chicorum. Um, but I will explain in a minute why we see not only Anthropocci chicorum, but we see a whole family of Anthropocci species to affect and cause the spinal osteomyelitis. I don't have to go much in detail in the pathogenesis because it was explained very well this morning, but the two theories or the two hypotheses that people bring is one, air sac infection causing a, 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 a bacteremia, causing a spinal abscess, causing that compression of the spinal cord, causing a paralysis. Personally, I was teached the same way like all of you, that this was the most probable cause. In the meantime, but what I know today, what I've seen also as potential solutions, I'm a strong believer with what we know today, that it is all to do with a poor gut barrier capacity during the early days of life. This means the first hours to first days of life that cause that bacteremia, that then lead to external access, etc., etc. I will give you some examples of why we think this hypothesis is the most common one or the most right one. Okay? We're not 100% sure, but that's why we call it the hypothesis and not uh, a proof. Symptoms are a little bit different compared to the wingtip walking um, image of uh, femoral head necrosis, yeah? because here we see three to five equal blurs affected, and we don't see pain response. When you have a wingtip walking bird, you will try to move it, it will, it will move. Here, it's really a lameness that is caused by that compression of that spinal cord, so there will not be a pain response. Eh? The birds will not be able to move. Even when they are very afraid, it's not about pain that they have to overcome, it is really the fact they can't move anymore because they are really paralyzed. Eh? So they are sitting on their backsides with their feet pointed forwards, eh? so a very different image compared to the wingtip type of lameness, eh? and then post-mortem examination. Okay. Uh, you have seen the pictures also this morning. Now, when you look at treatment of anthropocci, what is very remarkable, and I told you since 2010, you see something very remarkable, very interesting for practitioners to understand, to try to understand, is that we don't see one throat spreading systematically. If you have an outbreak of polybacillosis, you have an outbreak of ORT, you have an outbreak um, of typical bacterial problems, what we usually see is 
There's one clonal particular strain that has specific virulent factors that is able to go into the blood system and spread in the body and start to cause problems. If you have a problem where you don't see one clone of bacterium spreading systematically, what does that tell you? That tells you that the problem is not so much with bacterium, because it's not so much linked with the virulence factors linked to the bacterium, but is linked with the birds. Something is wrong with the birds, because not just one bacterium is able to slip through, no, many different similar families of bacteria are able to go into the bloodstream and spread. That is amazing. That is not supposed to happen. That is the first thing that we learned into our schools, in the university, is that you cannot have bacteria in your bloodstream because the immune system is going to stop it. So what is going, except of course it's a very pathogenic bacteria, but what is going on that we see all these different agrococci being able to go in, in your bloodstream? That is a question that is very important to understand and to answer. Now, why do we know that it's not one clone spreading systematically? I go a little bit back in time, let's say 2008, 2009, 2010, when we had its first cases of Epococci. Remember, this was not in the farms with poor hygiene. This was not in the farms with uh, specific problems. No, it was very difficult to predict where we had Epococci problems. So we were very really interested, and we took, for instance, uh, in one case, starting not with classical pathology and biochemical identification, but starting with Malditov identification, we took 18 anthropocyte field cases that we said, this is going to be anthropocyte coli. And what did we see with Malditov? 10 of them were here, one was fishing, one was fatalis, and only six for C. coli. That's interesting. We start to think, what do we do wrong? Because if you look at the results from the GD in the Netherlands, they do a lot of work on Sikorum. They say, yeah, it's Sikorum, it's probably coming from the breeders, and then it's in vertical transmission to the progeny. And we do a study, oh my goodness, we don't find Sikorum in all these cases. We find all kinds of interrogos. We did the same period, we did another study. We said, let's do it different. Let's not check 18 cases, let's go in detail into one flock. Let's take samples of young birds, seven weeks of age, of a flock that obviously doesn't have any focus problems yet, because it's only at three weeks of age. But we know this farm has a predisposition for anthropophyte problems. So what did we say? Let's take one flock, the same day, we'll take 11 animals randomly from the flock, and we take isolations from heart, liver, and bone. And then let's see what kind of strain we identify. We expect to find one strain, one clonal strain. What did we find? 11 different strains, all of them with a different resistance profile. Another proof that we're not looking at one clonal uh, issue. And yes, probably here we think is genetics. We have, and I will come back to that in a minute, but we have birds that are selected for lower feed conversion rates. And you know feed conversion rates, to lower that, there's two ways which are efficient, that both Ross and Pop and Hubbard are using. One is, they reduce the feed needed for maintenance. How can you do that? At 40 days of age, about 40% of the feed is going to maintenance. That means if you have a bird that eats so much and grow so fast that you can slaughter at 39 days of age, you gain one day 40% of maintenance. So what happens? Feed conversion rate goes down. Okay? The other thing that we do when we want to have improved feed conversion rates, it is lowering immune levels. I don't say that we have weaker birds, because mortality rates are lower than ever. But we are changing the immune system. And it's very logical, because the immune system, whenever you don't eat, it's a waste of money. It's like, it's like an army. I don't know here in Spain, but in Belgium, if you look at our army, we just think, what are they doing? Okay, maybe lately we are thinking more than we need than before. But before, when we look at an army, we think, if you don't, if you don't eat more, it's a, it's a waste of money. 
The same with the immune system. If you don't need immunity, the best thing to do is to put it at a low level as possible. And that's exactly what you do when you select birds that have very high daily gain and very low fetal conversion rate. You will have birds that have a change in immune value. So what happens is that that innate immune value at the level of the gut is being reduced, and that allows in this moment and the crocodile to slip through that barrier and cause this kind of problems. What will it be in five years' time? I can predict already, because we continue to select for birds with lower feed conversion rate, it may be maybe other bacteria, but this problem will come back. Maybe with some other species. How do we know that? So I will see that there's a leakage of normal commensals without specific village factors, as explained earlier. What we see in some areas, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, uh, we are experimenting a lot with new type of systems of hatching eggs in the house. Yeah. At first I thought this was a really stupid idea, because that hatchery is a very efficient type of factory. Uh, you can concentrate and disinfect your birds in a very efficient way. So in the beginning I was like a practitioner, I was thinking, uh, I like to think out of the box, but this was for me a little bit too much out of the box. Now, what we can see is that when we hatch these birds in the house, and they have immediately access to feed and also to bacteria, <coughs> when this happens, we see a lot less anaerobic drops. It drops to very low levels. So, what does that mean? That confirms the hypothesis that by stimulating the early days in life, the immune system at the level of the gut, then you can close that gap that's open for three hours or three days, and you will reduce your appetite problems. Okay, so that's something very interesting. And like I mentioned this morning, yeah, what you also notice is that before, at day of age, very commonly people use anorfoxacin to reduce polybacillosis problems first week of life. When we did that, we saw a lot of and issues, but when we start to use lipospectin instead, we start to see that endocrine problems were prevented. Why is it? If you look at the resistance profile of endocrine, yes, there is some resistance to endocrine, but if you look to lipospectin, it is not really dramatically more sensitive. Still, we see very good effect with lipospectin. That we cannot explain based on resistance profile. What is the only possible explanation that lipospectin can do that? It is because it is stimulating or triggering the immune system in a certain way compared to other antibiotics. And we know that lincomycin was used as growth promoter, and also know the theory of Professor Newold that explains. And growth promoters don't only have an effect on reducing microbiota components, but also they have an effect on immunomodulation. Okay. So everything there goes in a certain direction that we can say that anthropogai problems um, are not a problem of the bacteria, per se. It's a problem of selecting animals. Um, to a certain efficiency with low feed conversion rates and high levels of gain. And the problem is mainly the first hours of the life that this anthropogai can slip through the innate immune barriers. And here I want to uh, tell you what we are trying to achieve is to simulate, if you don't have a possibility to hatch the eggs into the house, what we try to do is now gel application method. There's different companies that are coming with the gel to the market. And um, with the gel, it's easy to vaccinate in the hatchery um, birds. Uh, it's very visible attractive birds. It doesn't soak the feathers. Um, and you can apply live viral, bacterial, and coxidose vaccines. That also means that in the gel, because it's buffering, you can even combine it with nutritional and polybiotic compounds. So at this moment, there are several groups that are trying to see can we simulate this early hatch system 
can be simulated in some way by applying this gel in the hatchery so that we have a few hours more early activation of the immune system. Okay? So this is something that we are trying. We don't have solid results yet, but theoretically it could be a very interesting way of um, dealing with endocrine problems. Let's move to Mycoplasma synovia. Mycoplasma synovia was also mentioned uh, this morning. Uh, here we have a typical vertical horizontal transmission uh, with hemodegenesis you know, spread, uh, causing possibly joint infections. Uh, with, um, for the locomotory system, mainly swelling of joints, foot and hock, uh, as typically seen here and here. Their diagnosis, then we rely not on isolation because mycoplasma is very difficult and slow to grow, but we uh, the, uh, we rely on ELISA and PCR to make the, um, uh, the diagnosis. In what is different today compared to 10 years ago is that we have different ways to fight MS now compared to the past. Eh? Of course, hygiene remains important to avoid vertical and horizontal transmission, like in the past. But we know that what works for hygiene in many operations doesn't work for MS because we have a lot of Integrations that are free of a gene that still have a higher rate of MS. You have seen the numbers this morning. Yeah? We still have antibiotic treatments that are can be used on little intervals, and macrolides, thymolin. This is still worldwide the most popular way to deal with mycoplasma. Sometimes we have questions on resistance profiles. When we make testing of mycoplasma, we can see that usually for all of the thymolins and uh, the macrolides, the sensitivity is very good. So we don't see a lot of resistance uh, with this compound towards um, mycoplasma synovia. What is new is vaccination. It's a new tool because we have live activated vaccines, um, especially interesting as the diagnostic tools are improving with PCR. You have seen some results from uh, this morning where you can differentiate field strains with vaccine strains. We couldn't do that in the past. Um, uh, well, in 2014, about 35% of the British infants were uh, vaccinated, and we could immediately see that the prevalence very quickly goes down um, of a mycoplasma synovia identified with, um, with PCR. Because what I don't like with mycoplasma is to use serology tests, because we always run behind. We need to use uh, PCR in order to be able to have an accurate picture of the situation. When we look at the real virus, also mentioned this morning, also vertical and horizontal transmission, um, infection of tendons, also respiratory system and intestinal tract, with possible swelling of hot joints, acid tendons, and very often infected disease. Depending on the strain, uh, we see more of um, locomotor issues, or we see more of enteric diseases. Here, clinical science, virus isolation infection can help you. You have to combine it. Yeah. On this moment, we have a wave of real problems in northern France, west of Belgium, southern uh, Netherlands. Yeah. Sometimes we, after a few months, this wave is gone, and then it can take another 12, 18 months before again we have a lot of cases. On this moment, the strain that we are having is an entire disease. We don't see any signs on the local system. How do we know for sure this is the problem? Well, we combine the clinical science yeah, with taking the PCR and we always send in a samples for a virus isolation to the lab and we confirm the cluster that this um, virus is a system of. Okay? If you look at control of infectious bone disorders, what are we doing to solve that? Yeah? Well, from a veterinary point of view, although it's a good factor, we can do something as a veterinarian. We are in this moment more and more vaccinating the panel stock. Because if you vaccinate the panel stock, yeah, for both for Enterococcus, Microbiotic Small Day, Staphylococcus, and the Leo, we are able to already reduce vertical transmission rates a lot. And in some cases, we can also um, have better maternal antibodies protecting the young chicks early in life. High energy status to correction has never changed. Uh, um, but also, proper feed and water management. Yeah, I say yeah, right, because for every disease we say we need proper feed and water management. But what I want to specify is that we focus on that early feeding 
and that early contact of my computer with the immune system. First, that is a really big trick, especially for epigenetics, to reduce the immune system. Non-infectious skeletal disorders, I will go very quickly uh, on this uh, because we don't see that so much anymore. It's pulmonopathies uh, causing paralysis. This is really a malformation of the bones. Yeah? Uh, we also will see like epilogue problems, uh, no pain response uh, causing uh, lameness. Um, we also have rotational and angular deformities. Uh, you can have valgus and um, uh, problems. You can have rigids, uh, they will... Um, or uh, lateral twistings, lateral touch of left, left uh, uh, tight carcass, still possible to see, but quite rare compared to infectious skeletal disorders. Yeah. Rickets, yeah, uh, origin is deficiency of calcium, phosphorus, or vitamin D. Uh, we have failed mineralization in the high visibility of the long bones, mostly rapid growing chicks, rubber skeletal names, also discussed earlier uh, today. TB, yeah, also mentioned uh, this morning, uh, very properly. Um, you can very easily see that uh, post-mortem uh, large axial cartilage blood. Uh, then food pathogenitis is something that is on the rise and that is having an increased um, importance. Um, to get it hot for the breast business, yield etiology is better than food. Pathogenesis, contact dermatitis, predisposing factors, all the ones that were mentioned also this morning, poor environment, diet, enteric disease, oxidosis, pathogenic enteritis, this is a great thing. Choice of bad little material and high shopping density. So also, lameness, short latency to lay down period, so means that the birds very quickly want to sit down again. Reduced feet intake, so for me, it is not a welfare issue, it is very clearly an economic issue. And very often, welfare issues go hand in hand with economic issues. Diagnosis, examination of fruit bats, erosions, discolorations of the skin, and ulcers, as of course in these case, but you know that scoring system was explained also this morning, so I don't have to explain it into detail. But remember, it's not only about welfare that you have to look at. We know there's a relation with poor performance if you have a lot of um, uh, food patterns. Now, I would like to switch to the link between um, impact of gut health, between enteritis, and the blood health. Because Gut health is probably the most important influential factor and common factor for all other disease nowadays. Although we have seen a whole variation of infectious and non-infectious causes, very often the gut health is the one common uh, factor. And it was also discussed during the round table, eh? and also there the conclusion was what the same. It's also the one that can be the most easily influenced. If you have a problem with genetic lines, how are you going to change that? You cannot. You have to wait for five years before genetic companies will come a new level, new type of birds. If you have a little infection, what are you going to do about it? You will change, you will vaccinate your breeders, and you wait nine months until you have uh, solved the problem. The one that you can do something with, yourself, in your farms, is to try to influence that gut health. So it's very important to understand all the links between gut health and laboratory health very well. Now, I will explain already this daily fecal birth rate, body weight gain, where is it coming from? Remember, maintenance and immune system. Um, we always, when we go to presentations of uh, Ross and Cobb and Hubbard, and, and I love them, they have great presentations, interesting talks, but when you ask them, where is the increase or the improvement in fecal birth rate and body weight gain coming from? They always give a very complicated uh, uh, presentation, it always starts with the pyramids. And then they see a lead, we are checking for many parameters and using lixis scopes and very sophisticated material and it's costing fortunes, that's why we charge so much for your bills. But they don't really say what they are selecting for. And to your very big surprise, the main thing they are selecting for is behavior. They are selecting for birds that have one goal. They are constantly hungry and they all the time they want to keep eating. That is something which is very, very important to understand gut health issues today in birds, also in the future, and to understand the of the reality. Why? We understand why this has got to be a good conversion rate and because you less need to maintenance. But it also means that we have birds 
that all the time have desire to eat, that automatically have more issues with the capability of digestion absorption. Why is that? As soon as something goes wrong, a bacterial attacks vicious circle will be started. Right? Remember a normal individual, like a human being, a pig or a normal bird, when they have a mild enteritis, it could be you eat too much spicy, or you ate too much, or you change your diet because you're traveling to Asia or an Asian was coming to this way, which is often more of a problem, you will have or you have to stress because of heat stress, or you, you, you forgot to feed the birds, and the, 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 the gut has been completely empty. What happens is that in a normal bird, there's a signal going from your gut to your brain. And it says, to me at least, when I eat too spicy in the night, in the morning, when I'm at breakfast, I don't want to eat pork and beans. I want to eat some yogurt maybe, and I will take a water instead of the heavy Spanish coffee. Why? Because your gut is telling your brain, you are not hungry. Because probably your capacity to absorb your nutrients is decreased. Normally, in a laying hand or in normal birds, that is the same. But this broiler stand is selected so intensively that it high fecundate behavior that they don't care about some inflammation. They don't care about a little bit of mycotoxin or a little bit of toxidiosis. The only thing they think of is, I'm hungry. I want to consume more feet. That is what happens because at that moment, they still have a lot of nutritional compounds in the gut and that can cause disruption of the microbiota. Okay? That is causing this bacterial enteritis and historically, we always focused on, on bacterial component or bacterial enteritis. We always said, Oh, we are using AGP, then we have very good gut health. So if you take away AGP, <coughs> let's replace it. First, we use the antibiotics, and we cannot use them anymore. We try to find something that kills bacteria. We find organic acids that kills bacteria. We find uh, enteric oils because it kills bacteria. We uh, use probiotics because it kills bacteria. My message is that this is not a wrong strategy, but if you want to be really successful, we also have to focus on dealing with the enteritis directly. Because this is a vicious circle that is self-feeding. And if you want to be efficiently stopping that circle, trying to control the inflammation, to control the immune reaction at the level of the gut, is a very successful approach. So I expressed this already. Um, I also will skip this one. Yeah, I just want to tell you in the in the gut. We have a very difficult task for the immune system because we have a dilemma. One side we want to keep out pathogens, okay, gram negatives, we want to keep them out. On the other side, okay, we don't want to have all the time inflammation against the nutrients that are in the gut. And you would and you would have a state of all problems. And you would say, yeah, so what? That is why we have a, 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 a intestinal diet, that is why we have an immune system. But I will tell you something. In the gut, it is filled with nutritional compounds and with bacteria. Okay? And if you look to the composition of a bacteria, did you ever watch a composition of bacteria? I will, I will show you. We talk about capsule polysaccharides. We talk about phospholipids. We talk about lipoprotein. We talk about papilloglycans. We talk about proteins. This is what bacteria have in their skin. Does that ring a bell? That's exactly what we are feeding our birds to grow. Did you ever wonder how the immune system at the level of the gut is able to differentiate between all these components? If it's from a bacterium, oh, keep out. If it's from the nutrition, please come in. How can they do that? Well, the way they do it is, let's keep this one there, um, is by having a lot of immune capacity in that intestine. We were teach as veterinarians that the most important immune organs are the spleen, the bursa of Fabricius, eh? but today we say that the intestine is the most important immune organ. In fact, we do realize that because 
We in the food industry, compared to the big industry or pet industry, we use a large percentage of vaccination to the drinking water. Why? Because we know that while it's eyes to gut, it will be recognized by the immune system and antigens will be uh, responded. Okay? So remember, the gut acid liver tissue takes about 50% of the aging immune system. So by far, if you look at the number of immune cells, this is the most important immune organ. And what happens when you overstimulate the immune system? I already told you. It's like an army that is useless. You have a much too big army, you activate that part of the army, your neutral priority will change. And your neutral priority will change from high to low, where normally an unactivated immune system is having priority behind muscle, just before fat tissue, it will increase the priority from uh, activated just behind the brain. That means that even if you have a very mild intestinal inflammation, one that you will not see from the outside of the birds, a mild toxic diosis, a mild mycotoxic infection, a mild viral infection, if you have that kind of enteritis, automatically, the muscle growth will be reduced and I will tell you even more. A lot of people think that the ballooning is originating from gas formation from posterior. It's nonsense. When we check this gut ballooning, we, the only thing we see is not all, sometimes we see some gas formation, but we always see that the tunica muscularis is reduced. And the tunica muscularis is the muscle that is closest to that immune system at the level of the gut. And the immune system is telling, come, I need you to fight to whatever is there. That also means that this ballooning is causing a lot of loss of peristaltic and antiperistaltic capacity. That is even further deteriorating our digestive and absorptive capacities. So very important. If you look at the composition, this is another very interesting, intriguing uh, field where we have learned a lot in the last 10 years. This is a slide, I think, from 2004, if I remember well. Yeah? And this was a slide that I was teaching. And this shows you a normal chip. Ilium, Lactobacillus CI, Shadium, Clostridia CI. If you have a problem with the gut, the Clostridia, they go up to the Ilium, and this is defined a bad gut. Now, this was right if you use the classic microbiological methods with other. In the meantime, we are using molecular methods. And what we have learned is that this very small fraction here, which is called unknown bacteria, in fact, is a lot larger. And about 90 to 90% of the bacteria population is in this slide not shown. That also means that we don't understand the microbiota today because now we are learning, but before we don't, didn't really understand the whole picture. And one example is a very interesting one, is when we look at polysaccharide, sugar metabolization or digestion, we are always teach that a good bacteria for sugar digestion is lactobacillus cilia. If you want to buy probiotic, buy lactobacillus cilia or bifidobacteria. You can buy it in the supermarket. And if you think of a probiotic for chickens, let's, let's do lactobacillus CI. Why? Because we always said we need a lot of lactic acid production. This is important. And it will lower the pH and it will, it will keep the posterior to the sheep. I will tell you a little secret. Lactic acid is one of the most toxic compounds that is present in the gut that can kill enterocytes. You will be surprised if I say this. Yes, it's true. You can believe it. The reason that still it's not wrong to say that this played an important role in the good gut is that what we learned now, some of these groups here, we didn't know about, they seem to be follicles, prostitutes of 9, 4, 14a. They will be cross-fed by the lactic acid bacteria. Uh, producing bacteria, 
They will consume lactate and acetate as a substrate, and they will produce proctonate and butyrate from that, um, from, from that lactate. If you have accumulation of lactate, you will damage the gut. It's only when you also have the presence of this bacteria that you have a good definition of a healthy gut. And what happens in a gut that is overeating, not all the sugars are consumed by this bacteria, so they won't be, become available for what you call the bad bacteria. That is what happens with these modern royal lines when they are overeating in terms of nutrients. And this is how we express it, this bacterial apparatus, in another visual way. It all starts with normal gut development of villi. In the beginning, for instance, coccidia is the most common principal factor, but it could also be a mycotoxin or a virus. And once this happens, there is a mild inflammation. And the gut, be it from a chicken, be it from a human, it will always react in the same way. It will react in three individual actions. One is, it will fuse the villi and it will shorten them. Why? It tries to avoid that this oxidia or mycotoxins or viruses can attack. So it just fuse. So some of them will still be able to attack, but the majority is flushing through. Very intelligent. But remember what is lacking in the modern broiler. It is the reflex to the brain that says, you are having an attack. Your absorbent capacity is reduced. Stop eating. Now the broiler continues to eat. It continues to eat. Second thing that happens is a lot of use production will be, uh, or the use production will be a lot increased. Usually we have here cells that are not endocytes, but that are called goblet cells. And the goblet cells, they produce mucus. Usually it's about 1 to 15, on average, will be a mucus producing cell. Yeah. Now, when you have this attack, there will be increased mucus production to protect that gut. And you see that the number of goblet cells will increase to 40, 50% of the total number of cells. I had once a salmonella in my gut. And I can tell you what it means when you have salmonella you have a lot of mucus production. You can see it in the morning. Okay? So, of course this is good, because at the same moment when I have a salmonella, I stop my feet intake 100%. Maybe I still drink some water, but I don't want to eat anything anymore. Or birds don't do that. They don't stop eating, but they have to reduce capacity of absorption. The third thing that happens, so, this fusion, Second thing is mucus production. The third thing is inflammation. This gut is activated to protect the possible attack. And this is, of course, the worst. Because this activation of inflammation is activating 50% of the immune capacity of the gut. Two, it also <coughs> will cause a lot of leakage of the endocytes that will open up. So that's a very important reason um, uh, why we have losses of uh, plasma proteins, and later on, we have bad bacteria overgrowing on the <coughs> excessive availability of nutrients, and also the poor digestive capacity, and also on the plasma proteins. This is one way of presenting it, this is the other way. This is the, the famous vicious circle of pathogenesis of bacteria enteritis, where we have the oversupply of nutrients in the room. We have the microbiota change, the bacterial component of bacteria, Enteritis. Yeah. Here we have a morphological functional alteration in the gut, it's less fusion, mucus production, uh, inflammation. That is causing even more poor digestion and absorption of nutrients, and that is for definition again all supply of nutrients. What we always have done is try to cope with gut health improvement by focusing on the second step. Try to give antibiotics. If you don't use AGP, use some amoxicillin. If you cannot use that oxygen, use some acid. My message is, think holistic. If you want to be successful, and we all know, if we have amoxy treatment, very often, four or five days later, we have again the same problem. Why? Because we didn't think of taking away one, and we didn't think of three and four, they are self-healing. If you want to be successful in treating bacterial enteritis or preventing, you have to synchronize your actions 
and focus on number one, two, three, and four. That's all the things we know. Right? Some companies, they will call it the policy. The most important thing to do with gut health is to control the mycotoxins. Otherwise, say, the most important thing to do is to control the coccidia. Yeah. No, it's all you have to consider. You have to check what is for you most important and deal with that. But do it simultaneously with also managing your microbiota and also, I think, a big future here, like you can say James and that, but I think a big field that we can improve is to understand better that inflammation and try to limit that uh, impact of, um, of uh, oxidative stress and inflammation. So, why is BE and local issues so well linked? Well, for all of the most common local issues, you will see there is a link with BE. Food better diabetes, but liver, skin scratches, and with liver. TD, food absorption movements. And the local problems, poor balance of the gut, very often impacting the advice on the other. All of these modern issues, the local issues, have a link with the advice. Is there other influences? Yes, but this is probably the most easy one to influence. Okay? Some more hints that I can give is the choice of antioxidant. If you look at antioxidant, we know. BE has gone into coccidiosis. We know the choice of adenosine can have a big influence on the effect of coccidiosis, but there is more to that. If you look to ionophores, ionophores come from the Greek ion for rain to carry ions. And what ionophores do is they take ions and they are amphitheric. The outside is lipophilic and can cross cell walls. The inside is hydrophilic, it can carry ions. So it will disturb the, um, the balance between ions from the outside and the inside of parasites. Now what you have to remember is that different ion forms, all of them have the same mechanism, but they have a different predilection for the different ions. For instance, molentin will have first predilection for the sodium. Uh, Last of six, it will prefer uh, barium or cesium. So basically they have the same mode of action, but they have differences in their preference for the ions that they will bind. Okay? That explains that um, that um, oh, let's explain this. Sodium binding potassium condensin in normal conditions, right? sodium potassium and chloride are absorbed in the proximal small intestine, regardless of feed levels. And the excess levels are eliminated to the kidneys with the use of water. The higher the excess levels, the higher the water requirements for intake and elimination. Now, what happens with monentin? Monentin has a higher desire to bind sodium. So you will have less uptake in the intestine. So you have more excretion of sodium in the feces without the of water. And you know that the requirements for sodium in monentin are higher in order to keep water consumption at a good level. So that is explaining why? Um, when you use monentin, it's a trick to lower your water intake and to influence your liver quality. And that, of course, has a link to your food pattern diet and with your locomotor issues. Okay? Last of is the opposite. Last of eh, does not have this feature. And here, the sodium levels or requirements of this module are the lowest of all ionophores. And it's also explaining why the cross resistance between monentin. And that's how it is. It's very low. So we can use it to control better oxidosis. On the other hand, we have to remember that in hot climate, that can help to a higher water intake. But if you have plenty of issues already, to use less of it, it will not be helpful. So try to understand what you are doing. And everything is linked to each other. Your coccidia control, the choice of the epoxidium, the weather issues. You have to know what you're doing. And it's very often in very subtle movements. So remember, at one end you have medicine, the other end has also. And you have to use them in the best possible way. Um, we also know that, of course, aerophores have a direct impact both on oxidia and oxidia CI. So automatically, they will impact the bacteria and rice in the condition. Right? So um, remember, it's not only choosing one enzyme all the time to have dry litter that I recommend. We also know that if you overuse 
idle force. This is the, one of the most common reasons why we saw bacterial enteritis. So you have to remember rotation of antibacterials is extremely important. So, um, including different toxicologies, vaccines. And I want just to indicate a new trend that we see in many parts of the world. One of them is surprisingly US. At this moment in the US, we have in the summer months more than 50, up to 60% of the complexes are using toxin vaccines. Why? Because they remove three nitro as an agricultural tool. They saw automatically that they have higher incidence of supernatoxidosis. And that is why I said we have to change our resistance profile. We will use vaccination to fresh up the coccidia strains uh, that are partly resistant to iron force. Now, the good news in Europe is that we have more choice than ever for coccidia vaccines. Now, finally, we have three vaccines. It's good. Why? Because for price competition, this, this is good. Okay? For the consumer, it's good. But also, what is very interesting for the veterinarian is to know that the composition of these vaccines is different. And I give you the composition here of the three vaccines, Ubiquar, LMAT, Patacos, and Hipatos, that are registered in Europe for the moment. And what is very interesting is that depending on the case, you can choose a profile of vaccine. So the Nibatox here is a little bit uh, in the uh, white, so we have it. But what you can see is that each of them have a different profile in terms of oxygen. For instance, the Wuvigat is a vaccine that is cycling a lot in the first two weeks of life, first two to three weeks of life. So the other vaccine, which is a Patox 5, you know, is extremely mild. If you have high infection pressure, sometimes it doesn't do the job. So, depending if you are dealing with a high infection pressure, if you are dealing with a high infection, uh, so, so density of the person, if you are dealing with little issues, if you have every situation different, but at least you can make a choice between three different life atmosphere vaccines. And I've used all three of them in practice. And I can tell you, depending on the situation, one vaccine will be better than the other. All of the three of them are, of course, good vaccines. But you have to check what is in your situation the best choice of a vaccine. So, conclusions. Nutrition, management, genetics, pathogens, jointly responsible for local diseases. You have to know all of them before you can come to profound solutions. You have to create your own holistic view. What is most important in your case? The only way to find out is to go in the field and check and make that process. Look at the issues are not a welfare issue. They might be for some people. For me, they are a financial issue. Because they have a huge impact on FCR, on culling and slaughterhouse condemnation. So it is worthwhile looking specifically at your local issues. Whatever the cause, the most easy way to try to influence local issues, and I think this was also the conclusion of the round table, is to focus on improving gut health and liver quality. Okay? And probably this will be the best way to cope with local issues. And with that, I think we came to the end of the presentation. I would like to thank you for your questions. Symptoms, right? okay, you're way too late. 
Of course, you can do, still do prevention, you can still use an antibiotic to do some um, treatment uh, to prevent spreading to the birds that are not affected, but a lot of them, they already weeks before they had the hemorrhagic spreading. So you are way too late to still uh, solve that issue. Right? So I would help us that agree. Um, for MS, uh, we know that if you treat first days of life and also again uh, around two weeks to three weeks, you can still limit the consequences of MS uh, pretty much. But of course, it's much more efficient to go for vaccination of readers and preventing birth transmission. I would, of course, agree with that. Yes, you can recommend the incubator to reduce the problem of the mosquito. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you have seen that one of the main problems that we have for the activation of the immune band at level of the gut is the delayed access to food. So the main action. There's many actions you can do, and everything has to be correct, of course. Everyone knows that we have to make the incubation process correct. But what I would recommend as a main action is to try to limit the hash window as much as possible. The more you will reduce that, the more you will avoid that some birds have extremely long lifetime before they access feed. And we know that the access of the feed, including intake of bacteria that can start activating the immune system, that is crucial to, first of all, have a good microbiota, but also to avoid uh, locomotory issues like anthrococci or VCO. So for me, try to limit hygiene. How can you do that? Make sure you don't have MS, because MS is creating variation in the uh, eggshell quality. Um, make sure uh, that your management of hygiene is okay, um, uh, and, and etc. <laughs> okay, so the first question. Do you think the hatching of eggs in the house will increase the future? Honestly, the first systems that came to the market were way too expensive in terms of investment for new equipment and they will, I don't think they will break through. In the meantime, and uh, I have to admit that my Dutch colleagues, they have uh, one big uh, strength. They are very, very, they don't like to spend too much money. So what happened is that people saw these expensive systems to hatch in the house. They said, we like the idea, but I will not spend that money. And they start to think, how can we make it cheaper? That is a very strong talent of Dutch people. How can we make it cheaper? In the meantime, I can tell you, some of them have brilliant ideas to combine the advantages of hatching inside the house and still have a very low investment cost. And we see the advantages of hatching in uh, the house. For me, the best proof that this will be the standard within five to 10 years time worldwide is that the biggest promoters for the moment of hatching in the house are the hatchings in the Netherlands and in Belgium. So if you ask me, in five to 10 years time, it will be standard. The other question is, um, look, proximal vaccination and locomotory health. We have indeed farms that have more anthrococci problems compared to other ones. Although they have the same feed mill and the same hatching, some farms, even some houses, have more issues with anthrococci. I told you the main driver for this is the genetics of the birds, it's high feed intake. Um, that causes the innate immune battle to be lower. Now, what you also know is that aggravating factors are litter quality, are condition of uh, in the house, uh, conditions in the house. We know that toxidose vaccination, with overuse of iron force everywhere in Europe, there's not a single country that has not overused iron force. We know that using vaccination to fresh up the strains in the fields, in the houses, mm. that improve the efficacy of iron force is getting a positive effect on gut health. Performance directly, but also indirectly, it will improve the situation of locomotive issues. Okay? So that is the link. Okay. Yeah. 
y sobre todo eh, más que a los pero bueno, eh, se ha visto <risa> al equipo que hay detrás en el video, que son los que realmente cada día trabajan en ello, porque estamos todos los proyectos que se trabajan desde la, desde la manera, un equipo de 18 personas, que ya somos en el video, después de cuatro años, con una media de edad de 31 años, que solamente la presentación no lo permite para los que no estuvieron, tenemos una media de edad de 31 años en el video, y el 60% de las personas que, que pertenecen profesionalmente al video eh, son mujeres, eso también es, y estamos viendo que está arriba, como cada miembro decía, en la otra comida, no recuerdo bien que cada año que viene la presencia femenina es más importante, y es muy bonito y bueno, y es lo que siempre haciendo, y la que nos hemos intentado avanzar un poquito. Eh, este tipo de dicho personas hemos sido capaz de organizar un congreso de ella, de por fin de inscripción, con 100 personas, que eso es un, un reto el pasado marzo. Eh, muy importante para nosotros y un equipo que esperamos que el año que viene pueda organizar en, en un país de América Latina un iPhone de carne y de busca que está previsto para octubre de 2018 y que empezamos a trabajar desde ya y eh, con presencia, bueno, tengo, lo he visto el primer día lo he con presencia internacional del equipo, con una persona en contenidos en Chile una persona actual comercial en Argentina, dos personas en Brasil y un compañero de viaje desde allí que sigue en Ottawa. Esperamos que los ellos sigan y el equipo que tenemos ya, como sigan. Y finalmente ya me despido de primero, eh, más importante, pidiendo disculpas si en algún momento hemos callado, si el primer día no había café o la comida era un poquito, había más calor de la cuenta. Y esperando que todos nosotros el año en mayo, en en un nuevo iPhone, que lo haremos en, en mayo si, si Dios lo quiere y los elementos nos lo permiten. Y nada más, muchas gracias por venir y felicidades a todos vosotros. Gracias.